Bengaluru, the IT hub of India, is home to 14 million people. Once famed for its cool, pleasant weather, the story has changed steadily over the last few decades. In May 2010, summer days averaged 28 degrees Celsius. By 2025, the same month scorched at 34 degrees, a sharp reminder of how quickly the city was heating up. But Sindur, a dog behaviour educator, has been able to beat the heat. She lives in the outskirts of the city in Bagalur, a suburban village. The region that they work with conserves one species. Her house, Chirvil, named after her pet dog, Chiru, is cooler than its surroundings because it is made of mud. You can't manage without an AC in, in Bangalore city anymore. Um, and winters also. My, my, it feels like the, my joints are in, you know, going to crack open. It's so cold. Uh, none of that happens here. I don't feel it at all. It's so cold and wonderful, cool and wonderful. I love that dome. I love sitting in the dome. It's so cool. And that window, I absolutely love sitting in that window and reading. The smell of it as well. Sindur's house is made using 100% mud and not an ounce of cement. Uh, most of the materials that we have used are either reusable, it's not one-time materials, so it's either reusable or completely natural, which means that after my time is done, it will decompose into the earth without leaving a nasty footprint behind, which is also important for me. It took four years for Mason's Inc. Studio, the architects behind Sindur's experiment, to complete this project. These stones are like sourced locally from the quarries. Like uh, these are all waste stones. They are not actually of uh, good size and all. So these are like um, after cutting the rocks into a perfect shape, you get waste pieces, right? So we picked those pieces and came. sourcing waste stones from local quarries to waste bricks from local brick kilns. The studio relies heavily on repurposing. We have a lot of brick kilns. Even closer to the gate, we have a very big kiln. So we, these are like discarded stones and uh, discarded bricks. We took them and layered it. It has also revived and developed vernacular mud architecture styles like the wattle daub technique. So we have done multiple techniques like uh, wattle and daub, earth back construction for the wall system. So here the one you are seeing is called wattle and daub. As you can see it's a very thin wall. This wattle and daub technique is called skin and bone of a structure. So wattle is basically like any wood woven together. For instance here we have used bamboos. So we had a lot of bamboos like cut into strips and weaved together as made as a panel. So it has lots of gaps also, like in that gap we fill it with mud and make it as a skin for it. Majestic bamboo curved water. Rosie Paul, architect and co-founder at Mason's Inc. shares the benefits of natural materials that go far beyond construction. So when you build um, a good house, which is well designed, responsive to climate, using the right materials, um, that's where the benefit of mud or lime or all of this comes in. Besides aesthetics, Rosie points out, it is vital that these houses enable passive cooling and keep long-term running costs under check. Because it re regulates temperature, it regulates humidity, avoiding the need for you to spend more on your operational costs. So through the lifespan of the building, it is much more cost effective. Sindur's house, however, is an anomaly. Today, 93% of Bengaluru is concretized. Made of cement, concrete and steel, materials with high thermal mass, houses in urban stretches are only getting warmer. 32% of India's total greenhouse gas emissions comes from emissions and operations of conventional buildings. 38-year-old architect and co-founder of Masons Inc., Sridevi Changali, explains why this happens. 
you know, even when we are looking for an office space of our own, those buildings are hot boxes. You have just your concrete uh, floor plates and you were just enveloping it in glass. There's nothing to do but to air condition it. And the air conditioning load that has been calculated, like there's been a study and the, cal the calculations are just ridiculous. How much energy you're going to require and how much heat that compressor unit is throwing out is just, it's not only the energy consumed, it's also the heat that is being thrown out from the insides of these buildings. At Shulagiri, a town nearly 70 kilometers from Bengaluru city, a construction by Mason Zinc is underway. The team is building a single-story farmhouse for a farmland company, a construction that plans to use about 7% cement. The rest of it will be made using mud. So uh, basically the soil tests that we do, there are two types of soil testing. So there's a sensorial one, which is... Before construction, however, Rosie explains Testing the soil on site is imperative. It's always important to know that if you're planning to build with mud, the soil that you have is conducive for construction. Any soil you can choose to take. Simple sensory methods help identify soil composition, after which lab tests confirm the results, helping decide the right materials and techniques for building. So the first set of tests we do are sensorial, which we can do at any point when we do a site visit. And then the next set is done in the lab, where you get uh, specific percentages of, you know, clay, sand, silt, um, etc. The lab tests here suggest using quarry dust and 7% of cement to make the soil mix. Quarry dust, often considered a waste material, is being used in place of the non-renewable sand. This stabilized mix is then compacted layer by layer as part of the rammed earth technique to build strong load-bearing walls. So you first pour, you do the, you sieve the, the soil that we have, we sieve the quarry dust that we have, we mix them together, we have the dry mix, then we wet it to a humid mix, so it's not a very plasticky uh, texture or anything, it's just enough to uh, kind of mould it into something and to activate the clay in the soil. We make the wet mix and then we pour it into our shuttering. So this wall that you see is actually a shuttering that is of this length and then we keep doing it layer by layer. The walls here, we are told, need no extra treatment. Left exposed, they add a rustic charm to the surroundings. Meanwhile, this roof design, also made from mud blocks, guarantees a cool roof. So if you see the roof here, it's being built with the same CSCB bricks. It's nine inch thick and it has a beautiful thermal mass. So it really blocks the heat uh, and it slows the penetration of heat by a lot while, while you're building it. While the efforts of a small group of sustainably conscious individuals cannot yet be termed as a trend, the curiosity around mud as a greener material for building seems to be growing. But how viable is it to implement mud architecture in the cities? Satya Prakash Varanasi, prominent architect and heritage conservation expert, points to ways in which mud can be realistically used in high-story buildings. See, when it comes to a multi-story building, what is critical? The total weight, it has to be transformed to the, translated to the ground. So, RCC columns, that's one little issue at the moment. We may, if it's a 10-story building, we may go with an RCC column and let's say RCC beam. It also can be steel, incidentally, okay? Steel frame, it can be done. Now, what is left out? We have the walls. Walls can be mud blocks. Natural materials like mud blocks or clay blocks, because of their dark and unpolished texture, tend to absorb more sunlight and heat instead of reflecting it. This is the opposite of what happens with smooth and painted surfaces, Satya explains. On the terrace also, we always and always advise clay blocks. So all these materials have very low reflectance. We have very, very minimal painted surfaces in the outside of the house, very minimal. 
So, the heat reflectance because of the painted surface is again very minimal. So, naturally its impact on the heat island is less. You can look at how a concrete building actually looks like. So, there is only so much that you can do with the material, right? So, what we end up doing when we are constructing with concrete is like an added layer of elevation to make it look more aesthetic. But when we look at an earthy element, it has a characteristic of its own. It has a different kind of an aesthetic appeal. Architects say, however, that the real challenge isn't building with mud. It is breaking the myths around it. Many believe mud homes can't survive floods or extreme weather in cities. But with the right techniques, Sri Devi explains, these very challenges could possibly be turned into strengths. It's a good overhang and if it's very high, intensely high rainfall areas, give it a raised uh, plinth. So you can do a, uh, with stones, you can raise the plinth to a certain height. So that way your walls remain protected and there's absolutely no need to do any sort of treatment on it. It can be left uh, exposed as is. In fact, that is better for the performance of the building. The upfront costs of mud buildings can be higher than conventional construction. The need for skilled labor is one of the reasons. For example, we could look at something that does not require a concrete slab. Uh, if you look at olden day times, you can see that stone slabs was used as our slab roof systems. But that's not something that you widely see now, right? Maybe one for availability, one more for skilled labor. But there are different options that could, you know, be evolved in order to make it suitable to a certain uh, category of housing as well. As Sindhur's house exemplifies, sustainable architecture is not only about mud. It is about rethinking how we build using what's local, natural and less resource intensive. Mud need not necessarily be the answer for everything when you talk about scaling up something. So there's, a, there's an interesting project which has used uh, kadapa waste for walls. Uh, there are interesting projects that have used debris bricks for walls. So there are different ways in which you can a look at sustainability need not always mud need not always be the solution and so we want to do it through a story storytelling kind of a format where as for sindur even as she retreats into the quiet corners of her home her house stands for more than just a refuge it is a bold step towards an unconventional way of building one that could become a model for others I suppose there's a deep instinct, an educator instinct in me, which is I wanted to create something where others can learn from it. So I wanted to create a space which would be a learning space and at the end of it also showcase what is possible with mud. Thanks for watching Eco India. If you like the story, please give us a thumbs up and subscribe to scroll.in on YouTube.